Got it. Okay. Um, we are going to start in five, six, which is all about factoring specifically trinomials. Okay. Factoring got introduced last week. Okay. The same stuff that we talked about last week is still possible. One of the first things you're going to look for, if possible, is look for a greatest common factor. If there is something you can factor out slash divide out right off the bat, you need to do so. And then we can continue from there. Okay, so step one, look for that greatest common factor. Again, I'll do some examples where we get to do that. But trinomials are going to be three-term problems, and we're going to talk specifically about two different methods, well, three methods for factoring trinomials. Kind of depending on what the problem looks like. So the first problem, the first set of problems, the easiest ones are if there is no number in front of the x squared. Now, again, they can change the letters. I primarily use x's just because it's easier for me to write. You can actually read them. Um, my math lab loves to use r's and s's and p's and q's and u's and t's. The letter doesn't necessarily matter. Just use whatever letter that they use. I use x's because it's easier for me to differentiate. If I start using s's, they look like fives. If I use u's, they look like fours. So I don't like that. I just use x's. Anyway, if there's no number in front of your squared term, we can factor this by what I affectionately call the shortcut method. Okay, because basically part of this problem is done for you. If you remember, okay, factoring is undistributing. We're trying to break this problem apart. To do so, we got to figure out what can we multiply to get x squared. And that's pretty easy. The only thing we can multiply that's going to make this work is x and x. So because we only have that one option, that makes this relatively easy. So ultimately, what we have to figure out is what two numbers multiply to get this negative 10, but also add to get this positive 3. Now, some people are really good at this, and they can just automatically, they know the number without even really having to think about it. Some of you are staring at this, and you have no clue. Okay, what I focus on and the way we kind of do this is if I'm talking about numbers that add to get three, that list is really, really, really long, okay? One and two, four and negative one, three and zero, okay? 100 and negative 97, you can add a bunch of different numbers and get three. But if we're talking about whole numbers that multiply, okay, this is gonna be factors, we're talking whole numbers here, okay? There's only a few numbers that multiply to get negative 10, right? So if we're talking multiply to get negative 10, we got one and 10 and we got, two and five. That's basically what we have to choose from. And then to multiply to get a negative, we need one of these numbers to be negative. So what we're looking for again is what numbers will multiply to get this negative 10, but also add to get three. If we check negative one plus 10, well, that's nine, that's not it. But wait a minute, negative two, positive five. Okay, that does add to get Three. So that gives me my factors. Okay, this is my answer. This is the factored form. We can check this if we want to. All right. If I were to multiply this thing together, so x minus two times x plus five, remember to multiply, we distribute. So x times x is x squared x times five, five x, negative two times x is negative two x, negative two times five is negative 10. If we combine those like terms, we get x squared minus three x, whoops, minus 10, okay, which is what we started with. So again, what we're trying to come up with, what we're trying to find, what we're looking for is what can I multiply to get 
my trinomial. And that's basically the steps to that shortcut method. So your variable is easy when there's no number in front. Okay, x squared is just x times x. Then we're simply looking for what two numbers will multiply to get this number, the add to get this number. Write them down, that's your factors. Okay, I'm gonna do a few more examples with no number in front of the x squared. These will all factor by what I call that short cut method. All right, my math lab likes to use bigger numbers. So we'll do something a little more complicated than just, you know, what multiplies to get 10. So same game, okay? No number in front of the X squared. We can do that shortcut method. So X squared is X times X. And again, we are specifically looking for what two numbers multiply to get this negative 81, but also add to get that negative 24. Now, when you have a bigger number, some people struggle with what do I need to multiply? Okay, get out your calculator and just do basic division. Start with, okay, 81 divided by one. It's a whole number, we can do that. So 81 divided by two. It doesn't divide in evenly, so two is not a factor. 81 divided by three, that's 27. That's a whole number, that's a factor. Okay, 81 divided by four, doesn't work. Five, doesn't work. Six, uh, nope, doesn't work. Seven, nope, eight, nope, nine, yep. Nine times nine. Okay, so use your calculator and just divide. Start hitting division. If you get a whole number, then yes, it's a factor. That's why we get three and 27, nine and nine. If you try typing 81 divided by four, you get a decimal, four is not a factor. Try typing 81 divided by five, you get a decimal. Five is not a factor. So you're looking for whole numbers. Now, again, to get a negative 81, we need one of these numbers to be negative. Now, we don't know if it's one and three and the nine or the 81, 27, and negative nine. We just kind of got to check. But we're looking for what's going to add to give me a negative 24. Well, it's not that one. Nine minus nine is zero. It's not that one. But wait a minute. It is negative 27 and three, okay? Three times negative 27 is negative 81 and three plus negative 27 is your negative 24. So this is my factors. Now, the order doesn't matter if you did the X plus three first and the X minus 27 second, that's fine. Order does not matter there. You don't have to do the biggest one first. You don't have to do the minus first. The order doesn't matter. What matters is you need to have this group in one set of parentheses, x minus 27, and you need to have this group in a set of parentheses, x plus 3. Because if we multiply that out, distribute that all out, that's what multiplies to get my negative 81. Okay, now occasionally they're going to sneak a problem in that is like this. Okay, x squared plus 10x plus 5. All right, no number in front of the x squared. We'll try and do our shortcut method. x times x is my x squared. So again, I specifically am looking for what can I multiply to get five that will also add to get 10. But wait a minute, the only thing I can multiply to get five is one and five. And one and five definitely does not add to get 10. One plus five is six. So if it works where nothing multiplies to get this number that also adds to get this number, this problem is not factorable, okay? You can force it to factor. There's a whole method for that, but that's beyond the scope of this class. So we just say that this particular problem is prime, okay? When a number or when a polynomial is prime, that just means it does not easily factor. 
Now that's where it becomes one of those things where you got to be careful and make sure you checked all the factors to see if you could find one because maybe you couldn't find one that multiplied to get 81 that had to get your negative 24 but it's because you didn't look hard enough it was there. In this case it actually does not exist nothing multiplies to get five that adds to get 10 so that's why this one is prime. And I do think they snuck one or two of those into your my math lab assignment so be careful with that. Okay, now, like I said, there are gonna be problems like this as well. Okay, three X squared minus 12 X plus 12. Now, this one does have a number in front of the x squared, so it initially looks like we can't do that shortcut method. However, if you remember the first thing I told you, you got to look for, we want to look for a greatest common factor. Is there something that I can divide out of, okay, all of these together? And if you look, okay, 3 and 12 and 12, these are all divisible by three. So if I factor that greatest common factor out, divide everything out by a three, we get x squared, 12x divided by three is four uh, x, and 12 divided by three is four. Okay, so now after we've pulled out that greatest common factor, what we have left is just an x squared with no number in front. So now we can factor this, or we can at least see if this factors using that shortcut method. So again, x squared is x and x. And again, we're looking for specifically what multiplies to get four that also adds to get negative four. Okay, multiplies to get four, we got one and four and two and two. Now here it needs to multiply to get a positive four, but we need it to add to be a negative four. So what we need is both of these to be negative. If they're both negative, they'll multiply to get a positive number, but they will then add to get a negative number. In this case, that doesn't work, but that does negative two and negative two. Negative two times negative two is positive four and negative two plus negative two is your negative four. So this is your completely factored polynomial. Now, when you factor out that greatest common factor, make sure you keep it as part of the factored form. Because again, if we multiply all of this together, we should get whatever we started with. If you just do the X minus two and the X minus two, that only gets you this far. You need the three to get you all the way back to the original. So you need the whole thing. But always look for a greatest common factor first, then see if the rest factors. Now, I said there are gonna be three methods. The easiest one is called that shortcut method. And when there's no number in front of the X squared, we're just looking for what multiplies and adds. When there is a number in front of the x squared, that's when these get a little more complicated. Okay, for example, we wanted two factor or needed two factor. Six x squared minus 11 x minus two. Okay, this one I'm actually gonna show you using two different methods. Okay, the first method is called trial and error. A million years ago, whenever I was still in school, this is the first method I learned. In fact, this is the only method that I initially learned how to use because I didn't know about the next method till way later. Okay, trial and error. It's similar to what we did with the shortcut method, but there's more things to have to try. Okay, so with trial and error, 
you're literally just trying to come up with combinations that work and we're just going to try and figure out which ones will actually work. What we're going to try is again, we've got to figure out what can I multiply to get that six X squared? Well, six is one and six or two and three. Those are my possible combinations. Okay, same thing. We also got to figure out what multiplies to get two, like one and two. Luckily, there's only one thing to try here. So we don't have a bunch of different combinations to try, but we do have to try them. So we got to try like 1x and 6x with 1 and 2. Or we can switch that around. Instead of 1 and 2, we could try the 2 and the 1. Or we can try the 2 and the 3 with 1 and 2. Or we can try the 2 and the 3 with 2 and one. And we've just got to try these combinations and see if one ends up getting what I'm supposed to end up with. Now, you don't have to write all of the combinations down. You can just write one down and try it. If it works, then you got it. You're done. Okay, but it might take you multiple guesses. So we'll just kind of see. We also got to kind of try and play around with this. We got to get a negative 11. We got to figure out what multiplies to get a negative two. So one of these is going to have to be negative. So we can just kind of try and see what we get here. Okay, one X times six is my six X squared. That's good. Okay, one times negative two is negative two X. One times six X is six X. Six X and negative two X is four X. That's not the negative 11 that I needed. This is not a good combination. Same thing, if I multiply one times six, I get six X squared. If I multiply 1x times negative 1, that's a negative 1x. If I multiply 2 times 6x, that's a 12x. And wait a minute, 12 minus 1, that is 11. It's not negative. So if I need to flip the sign, I can just flip those signs. This ends up being the correct combination. So we don't even have to try these. Now, most people don't like trial and error, especially when you've got a bunch of different combinations to try. But that does work if you can work it out. Most people don't like that because they don't want to do a bunch of math that doesn't get you anything. It doesn't get you any points. Okay. So there is an actual algebraic method for factoring this that most people like because this one always works. It's called the AC method. Okay. So again, I'm going to kind of write down the steps and I'll walk you through the steps. It's not as fast as the shortcut method, but the good news is this always works. So the first thing you got to do is you're going to multiply A and C. So if you can think of this in terms of A and B and C with your first terms, okay, that's where the A and the C, the AC method come from. So we're going to multiply A and we're going to multiply C. So 6X squared times negative 2 is a negative 12 x squared. Then, kind of like the shortcut method, we want to find factors of that negative 12 x squared that add to get that b term, in this case, negative 11. So again, I'm asking what multiplies To get this negative 12, that's also going to add to get this negative 11. Well, negative 12 is negative 12 and 1, or negative 3 and 4, or negative 2 and 6. Okay, and again, we're looking for which of those add to get negative 11. Nope, nope. Yep. So next, we rewrite the original problem 
but we're going to now use these two new terms in the middle. So 6x squared and minus 2. OK, that comes from my original problem here. But instead of this negative 11, we're going to use this negative 12x and this positive 1x. So we replace the middle term with those new guys. Now we factor by grouping. Remember, if I look at this group, I can factor out a 6x. Leaves me with x minus 2. If I look at this group, I can factor out a 1. Dividing by 1 doesn't change anything, so I still have x minus 2. And if my parentheses are the same, there's my factor. And then the other two left outside is my other factor. So 6x plus 1 and x minus 2. 6x plus 1 and x minus 2. Same answer, two different methods. One requires understanding how factors work and guessing and kind of multiplying and figuring it all out. The other is a straightforward step-by-step -step process, okay? Most people prefer the step-by-step -step process. I'll do a couple more examples so you can see that again, okay? But I'm gonna kind of focus on that AC method. And again, we use that AC method when there's a number in front of the X squared. When there's no number in front of the X squared, okay, that's when we can do that shortcut method. And it's way faster. You're just looking for two numbers that multiply and add. Boom, got it. When there is a number in front of the X squared, that's when things get more complicated. And that's when we got to do something different. Okay, we're going to factor 9x squared minus 14x minus 8. Again, number in front of the x squared. There's no greatest common factor. I can't divide anything out of all of these. So we just got to try something different. So we're going to try that AC method. So again, I'm going to multiply A and C. I get a negative 72x squared. Now, 72 is tricky because there's a bunch of things that multiply to get negative 72. Negative 72 is 1 and 72, 2 and 36, 3 and 24, 4 and 18, 6 and 12, 8 and 9. 72 has a bunch of factors. All of those multiply to get 72. And again, we need to multiply to get a negative. So we need one of these to be negative. My answer here is negative, so I need the bigger one to be negative. Okay. Do any of these add to get that negative 14? Nope. 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 Yep. Okay. So 4 plus negative 18 gives me that negative 14 x. So again, that's kind of the trick and that's what's going to make this all work. So now again, we rewrite. I'm going to keep my outsides 9x squared and negative 8, but we're going to replace that negative 14 with my two new terms. Now I'm going to factor by grouping. If I look at this first group, I can factor out an X. If I look at my second group, 18 and 8, both negatives, they can divide by a negative 2. And again, as long as my parentheses are the same, that's my greatest common factor. And I'm left with what was outside. All right, 
I'm actually going to go back and revisit a problem we've already done because I want to point out something. So we did this problem just a little bit ago. Okay. Now, if you're paying attention, you're being a good math student, you know you're supposed to look for a greatest common factor. It's like, oh, look, these are all divisible by three. I'm going to factor out that three. Then I can factor what's left using that shortcut method. If you're not paying attention, you get into that math robot mode where you're just kind of doing what you've always done. You're just like, I'm going to walk through the process step by step, bang, bang, bang. Okay, I see a number in front of the X squared. Okay, this will still factor using that AC method. So this one will still work, but I'm going to show you what happens after. Okay, so again, if we multiply A and C, we get 36 X squared. So again, we need to figure out what multiplies to get 36. It's one and 36, two and 18, three and 12, four and nine, six and six. We need to multiply to get a positive, that adds negative. We need these both to be negative. And do any of these add to get a negative 12? Nope, 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 yep. So again, we do that rewrite, bring my 3x squared and my 12 down, and then we're going to replace with my two new terms. This group, I can take out a 3x, leaves me with x minus 2. This group, I can take out a negative 6, leaves me with x minus 2. Oh, look. Parentheses are the same. I'm left with what was on the outside. This is correctly factored. The instructions will ask you to completely factor. This is not completely factored. Once you have factored, look again. If you look at this 3x minus 6, Okay, this is a term all by itself. What can we factor out of three and six? Right, we can factor out a three. That leaves me with X minus two. So if you can factor out a greatest common factor from your terms, that works as well. So then my completely factored form is three and X minus two and X minus two. You need all of those factors. If you just leave this, as x minus two and three x minus six. Okay, that's good. That's worth some of the points, but again, it is not completely factored. Now, hopefully you recognize we could have taken that three out from the very start. And now we don't have a number in front of the x squared. And again, we can do that shortcut method, which is way faster. What multiplies get four that adds to get negative four, that's negative two and two, okay? So when you can take out a greatest common factor and you pay attention to that, that makes this a much easier problem. You can still do that whole AC method, but you do have to make sure and look for a greatest common factor when it's all said and done, because then you realize, oh no, I could have pulled that out from the very start, okay? But that is the other method. So when there's no number in front of the X squared, you can do that shortcut method. When there's a number in front of the X squared, you can either trial and error, which I don't recommend, or you can use that AC method. So again, multiply A and C, find factors that add to get B, then you do the rewrite, placing your middle term with your two new terms, and then you factor by grouping. Now that goes right into 5.7. Which is factoring special polynomials.
Now, the first one is specifically to 5.7. So it's kind of rare for this to work out, but anyway. So in the actual homework for 5.7, if you have three terms, you'll be able to factor like this, okay? Normally this doesn't work. So normally when you have three terms, you're gonna need to do that AC method. In this specific section of the homework, it's gonna play out really nicely where, okay, you have two perfect squares. And if you square root those and add them together, that's gonna to give you your middle term. So basically what you're gonna end up with is the same set of numbers in these parentheses. So nine X squared, it's three and three. 16 is four and four. And if we're looking for what multiplies get a positive that adds get a negative, they're both gonna be negative. And if you wanna check that out, we could see, so three X times three X is nine X squared. Three X times negative four is negative 12 X. Three times negative four is negative 12 X. Negative four times negative four is positive 16. So this works. And another way to write this is simply three X minus four quantity squared. Now you can write it either way. I don't mind writing it separate because if I was going to foil this out, I would foil from here anyway, or you can write it as a quantity squared because again, we're taking that same number or same polynomial, same term times itself. And this is just one of those things that happens within this unit. So if I saw a problem like this on the test, I would go ahead and factor using the AC method. You'll still get the answer, but it takes a special polynomial to get this quantity squared, which you don't really know until you know. But anyway, um, same. So we've got 36 X squared plus 12 X plus one. So again, these are perfect squares. Square roots add together to get the middle term. 36 X squared is six and six. One is one and one. So that's gonna work Four six X plus one quantity squared. Now, again, I did that really fast. That only works on these, which is only gonna work in this homework. Again, on the test, if I gave you a problem like this, I would expect you to do it using the AC method. Um, the other set of specials that's really nice, and you'll get to like this one, is when there are only two terms. When you have only two terms, the way we can factor this is if we have a perfect square here, and a perfect square here, and we are subtracting. Okay, so that's why this is called the difference of perfect squares. Whoops, I can't spell perfect. Perfect squares. So these three things all have to be in place. You have to be subtracting. You have to have a perfect square number and another perfect square number. Now, when I say perfect squares, not everybody knows what I mean. A square number means you can take some number times itself and get that. So for example, one times one is one. So one is a square number, okay? Two times two is four. So four is a square number. Three times three is nine. Four times four is 16. Five times five is 25. You get the idea. So 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, yada, yada, yada. Okay, if you can multiply a number by itself, the answer is a square number. So 64 is eight times eight, 100 is 10 times 10, 121 is 11 times 11. Okay, those are your square numbers. So if you have square numbers and you're subtracting, this factors like so. Okay, what can I multiply by itself and get X squared? That's X and X. What can I multiply by itself to get nine? That's three and three. One plus and one minus.
So again, if you have two terms, they're both squares and you're subtracting, figure out what you can multiply by itself to get, figure out what you can multiply by itself to get, one positive and one negative. Now they're gonna start out pretty simple. From there, they give you some uglier problems. So they could say something like 25A squared minus 64 B squared. Okay, trying to factor this one on its own is a little trickier, but if you recognize, wait a minute, 25, that's one of those perfect square numbers. 64, look, that's one of those perfect square numbers. Okay, my exponents are squared. This is that, I'm subtracting. This is that difference of perfect squares thing. Okay, what can I multiply by itself to get that 25a squared? That's five and five, a and a. Okay, what can I multiply by itself to get 64? That's eight and eight, b squared, b and b. Okay, make one of those a plus, make one of those a minus. Works just fine if they give you fractions. So say we have 149th minus 100 R squared. Again, I've got two terms. Okay, that's a square, that's a square, and we're subtracting. 149, that's one seventh times one seventh. 49 is seven times seven, one is one times one. Okay, 100, that's 10 times 10. R and R, one plus and one minus. Now, if any one of those things is not present, then we've got to do something different or it's not factorable. Okay, for example, if they told us to factor x squared plus nine. Okay, yes, that's a square number. Yes, that's a square number, but we are not subtracting anymore. This does not factor into x plus three and x minus three because positive three and negative three multiply to get a negative nine. Okay, well, wait a minute. What if I did plus three and plus three? Well, then we don't have a middle term of zero. We get three X and three X. We're missing a six X. So that doesn't work. This is actually prime. It does not easily factor. So it has to be the difference. So you have to be subtracting and both of these have to be perfect squares. Okay, X squared minus eight. X squared is a perfect square. I am subtracting, but eight is not a perfect square. <coughs> Pardon. So again, this does not factor. I can't factor out a greatest common factor. There's nothing I can multiply to get eight other than the square root of eight, but we're talking whole numbers here. So this is also prime. Now, that being said, they will try and trick you here. And they may give you something like this. Okay, we are definitely subtracting. We have two terms, but wait a minute. Two is not a perfect square and 32 is not a perfect square. So that looks like Right off the bat, that should be prime, but wait a minute. Okay, again, what's the first thing we should always look for? Look for a greatest common factor. Is there something I can factor out of two and 32? Yep, these are all divisible by two. Now, wait a minute, X squared is a perfect square and 16 is a perfect square and Y squared is a perfect square. And I'm subtracting. So x squared is x and x. 16y squared is 
four y and four y, one plus and one minus. So again, look for a greatest common factor first. And again, if you have two terms, they are both perfect squares and you're subtracting, that's when we can do the difference of perfect squares. There is one other thing they can do with that difference perfect squares to try and trick you. Okay, let's say we got something like this, x to the fourth minus 81, two terms, those are both perfect squares. Okay, x to the fourth, that's x squared times x squared, 81, that's nine times nine. One of those is a plus, one of those is a minus, and that's great, that is right. But again, the directions are going to say completely factor. Okay, completely factor it all the way until it doesn't factor anymore. Well, this is a perfect square, this is a perfect square, but this is a plus, okay, that one's prime. It doesn't factor anymore, that's fine. But wait a minute, x squared is a perfect square. Nine is a perfect square and we're subtracting. In fact, I already did this example. It was the very first example I did, x squared minus nine. That factors into x plus three and x minus three. So that x squared minus nine breaks down again. Perfect squares and subtracting. Now, we can't break these down anymore because they're not perfect squares. We can't break this one down anymore because it's not subtraction. So it only breaks down if you have perfect squares and subtracting, hence difference of perfect squares. But this would be my final factored form. All right, last but not least, final section for this unit. Last thing we will cover before we test. 5.8 is actually using this factoring to do something. We are going to solve by factoring. All right, solve by factoring comes into play when We have something like this. All right, in math, algebra specifically, we want to solve equations, okay? That's pretty much the whole point of algebra. We wanna solve stuff, okay? What can I plug in for X that is gonna make this work? Our normal strategy for solving is to get the X by itself, get everything else on the other side of the equation, okay, using your opposites. Opposite of subtracting is to add, opposite of multiplying is to divide, stuff like that. Here we run into problems because we've got multiple X's. We can't isolate them. We can't get this by itself because there's two different ones and they don't combine. They're not like terms. So we need a different strategy. We can't get everything on one side and my X on the other. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna solve this by factor, okay? We're gonna turn this into a multiplication problem. Okay, we want to do that because there's this nifty thing called the zero product property. If you are multiplying two quantities together and you know they have to equal zero, well then, heck, either A is zero or B is zero. That's the only thing that will work. If I'm multiplying and my answer is zero, then either A has to be zero or B has to be zero. There is no one product property or two product property because you can multiply a bunch of things to get one. You can multiply a bunch of things to get two. But the only thing you can multiply to get zero is zero and some other number. So because this equals zero, we're gonna turn this into a multiplication problem by factoring. Okay, we just did this, factoring when there's no number in front of the X squared. That's X and X. 
then I need what multiplies to get negative 12, that adds to get negative four, that would be negative six and two. And now I can use that zero product property. Here I'm multiplying two things together and the answer is zero. Okay, so either this factor is zero or this factor is zero. So then we can solve, add six to both sides. X could be six. Solve this one, subtract two from both sides. X could be negative two. Now, this also brings about fundamental theorem of algebra, which says, I'm looking for my, there it is, looking for my pen. Okay, if you have a second powered polynomial, then I should have two possible solutions. Now, I'm going to go ahead and check them. I'm going to prove that this works. So if I plug this six back into the original problem, so if I do six squared minus four times six minus 12, that should equal zero. Well, six squared is 36. Negative four times six is negative 24. 36 minus 24 is 12. 12 minus 12 is zero. It checks out. That is a good solution. Same thing, if I plug negative two in, negative two squared minus four times negative two minus 12, it equals zero. Negative two quantity squared is four. Negative four times negative two is positive eight. Four plus eight is 12. 12 minus 12 is zero. This one checks out, okay? Those are two good solutions. You don't have to check your solutions, but heck, why wouldn't you? You can guarantee your answers will work by checking it. Why wouldn't you check to see if you have the right answer? Anyway, that's how you solve by factoring. I'm going to do a number of examples because there's a handful of things that they do to make this kind of tricky for you guys. And I want to make you aware of all of those. But basically to make the zero product property work, step one, it has to equal zero. If your problem does not equal zero, you got to make it equal zero. So get everything all on one side. If you got to move it over, okay, you're adding the opposite. Once you have it set equal to zero, that's when we factor. Turn this into a multiplication problem so that we can use that zero product property. Set your factors equal to zero and then solve. Okay, I'm going to do another example. Okay, again, step one, got to set it equal to zero. If it doesn't equal zero, we got to make it. So we're going to move this 36x over by adding the opposite. I don't have any like terms to combine, so I get 3x to the third plus 12x to the second minus 36x equals zero. So it has to, has to, has to equal zero. Step one, that has to be the case. Now we're going to factor. And all of that same stuff we've been talking about still works. So the first thing I'm going to look for is the greatest common factor. Well, wait a minute. All of these things are divisible by three, and they all have an x. So I can factor out a 3x. I divide that out. 3x cubed divided by 3x is x squared. 12x squared divided by 3x is 4x. Negative 36x divided by 3x is negative 12. And again, we're going to turn this all into multiplication here. So no number in front of the x squared. I can shortcut. x squared is x times x. 
Again, what multiplies to get negative 12? That adds to get four. That would be six and negative two. So set it equal to zero. Factor. Now set your factors equal to zero. So all three factors, we had three factors. We set all three equal to zero and solve. Divide by three, x could be zero. Subtract six, x could be negative six. Add two, x could be two. Which again, kind of nice. You see this is an x to the third power. How many solutions did I end up with? All right. Now, I said I was going to make you aware of some of the things they like to do to try and trick you. Thing number one, they're going to give you the problem partially done. They're going to make it look really, really easy. Okay. If they already have it factored and it's already set equal to zero, don't make this harder than it is. They've already done half of the work for you. So if it's already a multiplication problem and it already equals zero, all you have to do is set your factors equal to zero and solve. Now, like I said, where they're going to try and trick you is they're going to give you something like this. Okay. Looks pretty much the same. This one, you've got a multiplication that equals zero. Here, you've got another multiplication problem. Okay. What people try to do is like, oh, I'll just set, the, I'll just set these equal to nine and then I'll solve. Remember, that doesn't work. You have to set it equal to zero. To do that, we got to subtract the nine. To do that, we got to do it from this quantity. Now, wait a minute. We got to foil this all out. So x times x is x squared. 6x and negative 2x, that's 4x. Negative 2 times 6, that's a negative 12. Now, if I subtract 9 from both sides, I get x squared plus 4x minus 21 equals zero. So if it doesn't equal zero, we again, we have to make it equal zero. Now we're back to solving what we did before. So now that it equals zero, we factor. X squared is X and X. What multiplies get negative 21, that adds to get four. That would be seven and negative three. Again, set those factors equal to zero and solve. Subtract seven from both sides, we get a negative seven. Add three to both sides, we get a positive three. Now, again, if you wanna check, you can plug it back into the original problem, okay? If we plug our answers in, so negative seven minus two times negative seven plus Six, that's negative nine, that's negative one. Negative nine times one is positive nine. That checks out. We plug our three in. Three minus two is one. Three plus six is nine. One times nine is nine, just like it's supposed to be. That one checks out. So you can check your answers by plugging them back into your original problem. Oh, uh, one thing I also wanted to say, I've been writing my answers like this. This is perfectly fine. This is acceptable. My math lab is going to give you the option the way they want it. You're going to write it into these little squiggly brackets as a set of solutions. 
So you're going to write your solution so it looks like that. I forgot that my math lab does that. It's kind of goofy. But they want the set of solutions. So you write it in that set of brackets. So same thing, we would just do this one. Your solutions are negative two and two thirds. You would write it like that or type it, I guess, like that. And again, the order doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the smallest one first. Okay, you can still plug fractions in. You just put a comma in between. All right, one of the last things they will try to do to mess with you is, of course, they've got to throw in a fraction. Okay, again, step one, make sure you set equal to zero. Extremely important. We're already here, zero is good. Now, we haven't really factored trinomials that had a fraction in them, but if you can remember back to last chapter, one thing we can do with equations, because this equals, okay, one thing we can do is we can come up with an equivalent expression that has no fractions. So if we multiply by that lowest common denominator, we can get rid of our fraction. So if I multiply four times X squared over four, we get four X squared over four, those fours cancel, that's just x squared. We multiply four times five x, we get a negative 20 x over two, 20 divided by two, that's a 10. Again, no more fractions, four times four, that's 16, four times zero is zero. So if they give you a fraction problem, you can multiply by that lowest common denominator. So two and four both go into four evenly. If I multiply everything by four, that gets rid of my fractions. And anyway, this is a much easier problem to solve. So again, I've got an X squared, no number in front. It's X times X. Then what multiplies to get 16? That's gonna add to get negative 10. That would be negative eight and negative two. Again, set those factors equal to zero and solve. All right, so that's gonna be the fun for chapter five. That finishes up chapter five. Um, the homework. So my math lab, all that stuff is going to be due. Don't forget to do your homework. Once that comes due, there's no going back and refixing it. Okay. So make sure you're taking your time to get it done. Also, do not wait until the last possible second. It's too much to do all at one time. Each of those assignments has like 12, 14 problems. Okay. It takes a minute to do. Don't give yourself just a short amount of time. Give yourself some time. Work on it ahead of time. Okay, math is also one of those things that while I've covered this stuff and it's fresh in your mind, it's always going to be easier. Um, go back and try to do this in you know a couple of days. It's like, crap, I don't even remember what to do anymore. I'll forget the set things equal to zero. I'll forget what I'm doing when I'm factoring. So anyway, try to mess with this a little bit each day. Knock some of this stuff out. Make sure you're doing your homework. Um, okay, also, as a reminder, I said I was going to do this again. We do not have a Zoom class next week. Okay. You guys are testing next week. So just like the first test, I will make sure the proctored sites have a copy of the test. Uh, I'll send it to Springfield, Lebanon, Republic, Waynesville, and then, uh, the, oh my gosh, I lost the, the other campus. Anyway, I'll make sure the campuses that I used last time also have a copy. This time you will need to call and set up an appointment or email and set up an appointment and take your test just like you did last time. Okay, so you got all of next week to get that done. I'll send out an email as a reminder, um, but that's gonna be on you guys. And then no Zoom class next week. Okay, this is also the last one we miss other than Thanksgiving. Other than that, we will be meeting. So that's all I got. If you have questions, stick around, you can ask them. I'll do my best to explain it to you. But otherwise, you're on your own. No class next week. Test next week. Get it done.
All right. See you guys.